It is a pleasure to be here this evening um, again. And how many were have um, been in one of the other uh, uh, seminars that we uh, have done? That's oh wow, lots of you guys and ladies. So that's awesome. Uh, so I am very thrilled to be here. My name is uh, Dr. Scott Bush. I'm a clinical psychotherapist and uh, sex therapist, and I'm a Christian sex therapist, which there, I think I'm the only one in about 100 miles, so there's not very many of us. And tonight we are talking about the uh, power of the mind. And uh, so there's a little bit of information about myself. Can you tell me what color those letters are. Go ahead and just say it out. Red. Red. Okay. We'll, we'll, we're going to go with red because I'm kind of colorblind, and so it may be an offshoot of red, but it's red to me. Okay. So then we're going to go through a couple of these slides, and you can tell me what color you see. So this is working, but this isn't. Okay. What color are the words? A little bit harder, huh? Okay. What color are the words or the letters? What color? Purple. So it's called the Stroop effect. And so that was a little bit more difficult because you had to think about it. The first one was easy because it was red and it said red. The next ones were a little bit more difficult because we typically read words first before we recognize color. So when you have a word with a, uh, that says one thing that's a different color, it takes a little bit uh, more um, processing to read that. So the mind defaults on what it is um, most familiar with. So we kind of have like a default in how we think, and it's sometimes it's very hard to, to get out of that. So if we have a positive mindset, our outcome is usually better. There are people that are negative, and it seems like negative things just keep happening to them. There are things that ha are more positive, they, they speak more positive, and more positive things happen to them. But not really, because they're looking on the things that happen to them. What are the positives rather than what are the negatives? And so that, when we think about the positives, it help us, helps us to have a more positive attitude, which uh, it's much easier to recover uh, from uh, different uh, situations with a positive attitude rather than a negative attitude. So uh, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe he can achieve. And so that was by uh, Napoleon Hill. So uh, that is a, a beam that uh, is running uh, across uh, uh, two, two little mountains there, and uh, it's pretty far down. Can anybody do that? Yeah. I can't do it either. He didn't start there. If we took that beam and we set it from here over to here, and we ask someone, can you walk across there? I'll say, yeah, that's pretty easy. I can walk right across there. If you take that beam and put it 1,000 feet in the air, you can't walk across it. You know why? You can't wrap your mind around it. Your mind isn't going to let you walk across there. But if you take that beam and then you move it up six inches and you walk across it, you move it up another six inches, your brain is starting to wrap its mind around, I can do this. And then if you're really brave enough, you can try that. I'd rather use like a two by 10 or a, like a two by 40. Yeah, I don't know that I'd walk across it either, but <laughs> you can get to that place. Um, there's um, another um, saying, uh, for as he thinks within himself, he is. So if a person thinks they're a failure, they're going to act more like a failure. If they think that um, they're going to be a success, they're going to act more like a success. And so how we think has a lot to do with uh, um, how we're going to walk our journey of life. So this is uh, a sample of the mind. So we have right brain, 
which has creativity, feelings, imagination, art, um, tune of songs. And then on the left side, we have math, logic, analysis, science, and words of songs. So who can, who would identify more with the, the right side? Most of the women would. Is that true? And then the left side, analysis. Yeah, that's the guys. Yeah, that's us. Well, let, let's, let me figure out how this works. So the challenges is most of the time are our, the ladies are on the other side and we're on this side. So that can pose a lot of communication challenges and other challenges. And there's a benefit to working on the right side. Um, you get to experience feelings and you get to share what feelings are. Typically, if you ask a guy, so what are you feeling? They're gonna say, well, I'm thinking about, no, no, what are you feeling? I have no idea, what do you mean, what am I feeling? We have a much harder time getting in connection with our feelings. You ask a woman, what are you, what are you thinking? She's going to tell you what you're feeling. And so being able to get on the other side of the brain can be very beneficial. So here's one of the reasons it can be beneficial. Sometimes you need, you need creativity with intimacy. If you're always on the left side, you're always on the analytical side, you're not going to have so much creativity. So if you can work on the other side of the brain, you can have some more creativity. So what would creativity look like? Creativity may be, I'm gonna put rose petals all over the bedroom floor, so when my wife comes in, she's just gonna be totally amazed. I'm gonna light some candles, I'm gonna do some aromatherapy. Uh, if you take a dry erase marker, you can take that and you can write on a mirror and it'll stay on that mirror. When she takes a shower, the words kind of stand out. And so it's kind of very romantic. So the creativity side, we're gonna have more romance. Romance is really good, because romance is really what sets a, a woman up for um, enjoying intimacy more. Um, we're more analytical. Boom, boom, boom. It doesn't, doesn't do a whole lot for, for, uh, for a lady, though. So then we have, sometimes you just, you just have no hard feelings. And so um, I'll give you a second to pick up on what that means. So I saw that and I thought, well, that's kind of like a double meaning there. So I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. And sometimes when you have no hard feelings, you have to use some creativity to enjoy intimacy. Part of the challenge with the mind is, the mind is the biggest sex organ that we have. Then the mind can shut down the body. So there's a, um, a piece called performance anxiety. And performance anxiety is the mind shutting down um, the body. And performance anxiety can be, I have had some challenges with erectile dysfunction, and so I am so worried that this thing is not gonna work when I try to use it. We get so stressed over that, guess what? The mind shuts it down, and it doesn't work. It's amazing just knowing that I don't have to perform tonight. We're just gonna have, we're gonna be intimate. And so I say intimacy is touching, it's very close, it's, it's non-intercourse, uh, so that I consider that intimacy. I can consider romance, the, the flowers and, and things like that, and, and passion is the feelings that you have um, for, the, uh, for your um, significant other. Um, so the, uh, that, uh, that performance anxiety, if you say, you know what, tonight, not interested in, um, having intercourse, just want to be close, just want to be intimate. Uh, many times, going into that fun, creative activity, your parts work better because there's no expectation of performance. And so we're not stressed out of our mind wondering, are my parts going to work or not? It doesn't matter if it works because I have no intentions on using it. And if it shows up, then you can use it. But, uh, but going into it, 
not, ex not stressing yourself out, oh my gosh, is this gonna work? I don't know if this is gonna work. Um, then a lot of times if it doesn't work the way we want, we don't use it. So I have this old car, it's a 1967 Oldsmobile 442. Uh, I started to rebuild it, I don't know how many years ago, probably 10 or 12 years ago, probably 12. Yeah, somewhere around there. So I took the, the, the body off the frame and just redid everything. A friend of mine did the same thing to his car. He has some 50s car. He's a little bit older than I am, so he has an affinity for uh, cars a little bit older. So we both finished our cars about the same time. My car is amazing. You start it up, it starts up every time, and it drives. It's never broke down on me. My friend's car, he's got uh, a, a 409 in it. So whatever car comes with a 409, someone probably knows what kind of car that what is. So he, that's what his car. Every time he takes his car out, it breaks. Guess who doesn't use his car? He doesn't use his car because it never works. And so sometimes we're the same way. If our parts don't work, we're just not going to use them. Um, so not putting so much pressure on ourselves um, can help us to um, have a uh, not so many hard or have uh, more hard feelings. So this is uh, this is our brain, and uh, these are this is the uh, triune brain theory. So on the left is uh, brain stem, cerebellum, and it's like where the fight or flight. Uh, response is you have a limbic, limbic system, emotions, memories, and habits in the middle, and then on the right is language, abstract thought, imagination, and consciousness. So when we're not able to uh, perform because of performance anxiety, it's like way over here. It's a problem in this area, and so it's, we can't just kind of think ourselves through it. It's much deeper than that, so you have to Sometimes you have to get psychotherapy to kind of retrain your mind. Uh, many times just uh, not putting pressure on yourself uh, is a huge uh, help to uh, allow your parts to work better. Does that make sense? So the power of the mind on our recovery, this uh, hedonistic adaptation, uh, that's called the happiness line. So people are about as happy as they want to be. Um, so some people's line is way up here, and they seem to be very happy about everything. Other people's line, way down here, don't seem to be very happy about things. And so let's say our line is, is right here, and when good things happen, our, line goes, our, our, our wavelength goes up, and then it goes back down. We get a new car, we're so excited, oh this is, I'm so happy. And then we get used to the car, and it goes back down. And I got a bonus, $1,000, woohoo. Gets happy, goes back down. So good things make it go up, bad things make it go down. But people are about as happy as, as they are. So there is something that allows our happiness line to increase and go higher. So what that's called is gratefulness. So gratefulness produces joy and joy is a perspective, an attitude that changes our happiness line. So being grateful for things. Uh, someone shared with me when, when they think about being grateful, they'll go through the alphabet, A. I'm grateful for my automobile because it has air conditioning. And so they'll say that out loud. B, I'm grateful. I have six boys. I am so grateful for that. C and they'll go through the alphabet. As they go through the alphabet, verbalizing what they're grateful for, they find themselves happier than when they started. So I did an experiment. I have a really great relationship with my wife. We've been married for um, 34 years. And uh, on my way home, I decided I'm gonna start going through the alphabet. And I thought A, and I thought, okay, I'm grateful for that. B, I got down to about G and I stopped. By the time I got home, I live like an hour away from here, 50 miles, I about jumped on my wife, kissing her and hugging her. I was so grateful to see her, and I, they, we didn't even have a problem. But I got to see how it changed um, my mind about how I thought about my wife, who everything was great anyway, it just made it better. And so being grateful for things. Uh, not everybody has everything going perfect in their life, but what are some of the things that we're grateful for 
And that's what can make us really happy. It's not things that make us happy. There are people that have a lot of things that are very rich, that are not very happy. It's the people that are grateful for what they have, grateful for the people that they have in their lives, grateful for the situation that they have. Uh, being grateful helps our happiness line to go up. So this is uh, practice makes perfect. So in uh, University of Chicago, uh, uh, Dr. Biesler did a study. So it was a basketball study. So he got three groups of people and uh, he tested each one of them. So they did uh, free throws and uh, then he would test them at the end of this uh, uh, study. So the first group, um, every day for an hour, they practiced throwing, um, doing free throws. The second group, they didn't get a ball. They had to go in a room and they got to sit there and they got to visualize them throwing a basketball through a hoop. And then the third group did nothing. They just played on Facebook on their phone. So then at the end of the study, he got his results. So the first group that practiced every day, they improved by 24%. They expected that they would improve. The second group improved by 23% without touching the basketball. And so you wonder, how in the world did they do that? So how they did it is through visualization. And so they had already shot a basketball before, so they know how it's supposed to be done. So they visualized everything as if they're the first person doing it. And so um, they could vision themselves at the free throw line, feeling the basketball, seeing the goal, hearing the noise, and they would feel the ball roll off their fingers, see the ball traveling through the air with perfect backspin, hear and see the ball squish through the net. So as they did that, in their mind, they are uh, duplicating what the people on the basketball court are doing. So you can't do something unless you wrap your mind around it, but you can wrap your mind around it even just visually. And so this was a great example of what the power of the mind and what can we see ourselves doing that we're not able to do. Uh, many times the things that we can't do is because we have some type of a, uh, a block because of trauma or whatever, it's stopping us from doing it. So I do um, a lot of therapy and uh, the newest uh, piece that I've been working with is um, I have individuals that are having a hard time with something. Um, they are uh, almost at a very, very relaxed state, and I had them visualize. So I had this patient that suffered for, um, for a year with dizziness, and no one could fix her dizziness. And so they sent her to me, and they said, it's a sight problem. And I'm like, oh dear Lord, what am I gonna do with this? You know? <laughs> and uh, so I prayed, I said, God, give me wisdom. So I said, I want you to sit here, I want you to, to be as, as quiet as you can, we're gonna concentrate on the music, and be very, very calm. And now I want you to visualize what life would be like with, without the dizziness. And so uh, this lady, she started to visualize what her life would be like. And it was like 20 minutes. She kept imagining life. When I was done, I, when she was done, I said, okay, what does it look like? And so she told me all of the things that she would do. I said, okay, I want you to stand up. She stood up. I said, are you dizzy? She said, I'm not dizzy at all. So her dizziness went from like a seven out of a 10, which is very dizzy, all of the time for a year, to zero. She couldn't even hardly walk. We walked all around, no dizziness. That was like, it kind of amazed me, but it's like the power of the mind in her recovery. She had to wrap her mind around doing that. And it's like her mind uh, rewired her brain so that that dizziness was gone. It was pretty phenomenal. I wonder what it would be like if we could visualize our, ourselves doing the things that uh, we don't do very well and doing them, doing them better and seeing ourselves doing it. Just like walking across the, the beam. I have to see myself do that. I can't do much if I can't wrap my mind around it. 
Um, and so I thought that was a, uh, a great study. Anybody watch the 2008 um, uh, Olympics? So this was Michael Phelps. And I uh, don't know if you know Michael Phelps' um, story. So when he was uh, training, he had a coach that was uh, pretty tough on him. And so he practiced all the time. At one point, the coach said, I want you to, I'm going to turn off all the lights, and you're going to do the breaststroke back and forth like it's a real race, but the lights are going to be totally off, no lights, because one day you may have to swim, and it's going to feel like you, you may not be able to see. And so he said, okay. And so he started to, he started to, uh, to swim uh, blindfolded, basically, with his, with his eyes closed. The, the lights were down, and he was able to do that. Then uh, every night before he would go to bed, he would imagine himself swimming that breaststroke. He knew how many, um, how many strokes it took to get to the other end. He could see himself going in the water, turning, spinning, hitting off the wall, and coming back, and then again. And so every, every night he visualized that. In 2008, he's up for the gold. He jumps into the water, and his goggles fill up with water. He's blind, he can't see a thing. And his mind said, I've been here before, I know what to do. And so he swam. I have it on that link. It's like a two minute, two minute link, so I, I got to watch him. And he won the gold medal, totally, totally blind. He won it because he didn't, um, he didn't panic, he'd already been there before. And so um, he was able to uh, win the gold blindfold. So being able to see yourself do things is um, very powerful uh, to be able to do those things uh, later on. So the mind is amazingly uh, powerful. So surgery can be traumatic. A lot of uh, things in life can be very traumatic. So trauma is... Uh, um, an event outside the normal human experience. Uh, it's defined as uh, experience unable to be processed and integrated. So trauma can make a person feel powerless, helpless, uh, paralyzed. Examples of trauma could be robbery, vehicle wreck, serious medical diagnosis, life-threatening event. Other examples uh, uh, could be being bullied, not living up to parents' expectations. Uh, when these traumatizing events happen, they get locked into the, the right brain, and then they can direct our lives and stop us from doing things and uh, have us behave in behaviors that we typically wouldn't behave in, because many times we're taken back to when that trauma happened. So, here are some of the pieces of trauma. Could have intrusive memories, hopelessness, decreased concentration, insomnia, loss of interest, irritability, depression, hypervigilance, little or no memories, our parts may not work, chronic pain, eating disorder, substance abuse, our parts may not work, uh, emotional uh, um, overwhelmingness. Um, and so all of this can be considered trauma and it takes our, our body a while to recover from trauma uh, physically and sometimes psychologically it can be uh, much longer and sometimes people never recover psychologically if they have uh, like a PTSD um, short of getting some therapy. For some people not being able to um, perform uh, sexually or having other medical problems is very traumatic and it can cause uh, additional trauma in the future. So for example, I do uh, chronic pain, chronic pelvic pain, and so we have a lot of people that suffer from this chronic pelvic pain, and medical doctors are like, we don't know why you have the pain. Your pain levels are very high, and they shouldn't be that high. We don't know why they're, why they're that high. So they send them to me, and they said, it's in their head. So people don't like to be told it's in your head, but many times it is in their head. So, I do trauma therapy on their operations and take away their chronic pain. 
So we did research in Chicago, or we presented research in Chicago um, last year, and we took chronic pelvic pain, which is typically uh, patients were about a seven pain level and took them down to a three, all by doing psychotherapy. So that, that surgery and all of those procedures were traumatic, and it was keeping them from recovering. And so basically we're rewiring the brain, having them reprocess those events, and they were able to um, recover and uh, much less pain than they were in before. We can't take away pain that's caused by a physical thing, but we can take away pain that been, can be connected psychologically. So humans have a physiologically based information processing system. So information processing system processes multiple events um, of uh, experiences and stores memories in an accessible and useful form. So memories are linked in networks that contain these images, thoughts, emotions, sensations. When a person is upset, the brain uh, possesses information more in the emotional side than the logical side, and then this trauma gets stuck in the emotional brain. So the trauma can be over, but the, um, the event is like still alive in the brain. And when the event's still alive in the brain, uh, the person can still have some of the same thoughts, feelings, body sensations as when that trauma first uh, started. So the brain doesn't process the event totally. And uh, so the cognitive and sensory aspects of the event are stored maladaptively, which means they're in your brain and your brain doesn't know how to process it. And so it gets stuck there. And then that's connected to the nervous system. And so then the person can't get rid of it. And uh, it, is, uh, uh, it can be very, uh, very challenging because they're like constantly triggered. So a traumatic event gets stuck and remembering the event can feel similar to going through the event originally. Um, you can have the same thoughts, feelings and such and there's different instances of uh, different types of, uh, of trauma. It can interfere with how a person sees the world. Um, along with the event is a negative thought or feeling that stays with the event. So with a, um, a traumatic surgery where it, uh, it changes how, um, how your life is, that can be very traumatizing. And being able to wrap your mind around that and um, uh, recovering from that, uh, a lot of that is, um, is how, you th how you think about it. Can I look, what are the positives? Well, the positives, one of the positives, I'm still alive. Um, there are some negatives, but there are a lot of positives. And so how we look at it is very helpful uh, for our um, recovery. So there is a, uh, a type of processing that uh, is very, um, um, it's, it's very natural. So when people get bad news sometimes, um, say they're in a hospital, they get bad news. They say, you know what, I need to go for a walk. And so they go for a walk. So as they're going for a walk, there's a, um, a right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, and it's there. there's a bilateral stimulation that's happening, and it actually helps the brain to process. Most people feel better after they go for a walk. Uh, and so they get bad news, they go for a walk, they come back, and they say, okay, now what are we gonna do with this? Um, so that, that bilateral helps us to process. And it is very similar to the bilateral that we get when we're sleeping. So when we're in REM sleep, our eyes are going back and forth and we're, our brain is getting emotional resolution. So we can uh, get uh, emotional resolution. We can get a lot of stress relief and processing uh, different types of junk that we may have in our head by walking, by rocking, by swaying. Sometimes people tap. And they may not know why it feels good, but it does because that's the brain's natural way to be able to process the, the junk that's here in the right brain that they just received. And then the analytical side is very logical. Um, and so it makes the left brain talk to the right brain and they're talking back and forth. And so it can take a disturbing event that happens and it can 
uh, lower the, um, the disturbance level. And so it can be um, very helpful. So this is a type of uh, therapy. It's, uh, uh, it is a type of therapy called um, EMD EMDR. And it allows the brain to reprocess highly disturbing events, uh, similar to how our brain processes while we sleep. Except when we sleep, we're kind of delusional. When we're awake and we process these highly disturbing events, it allows the brain to rapidly reprocess and desensitize um, these uh, negative events that have happened in our life. So it can take away um, um, erectile dysfunction if it's performance anxiety because it allows the brain to reprocess that and get that junk out of here that's stuck that keeps us from being able to perform because it, it lowers that stress. So when we go into um, that intimate time, our stress level isn't so high that it's shutting down our body. So if, if, our, if our stress gets very high, our body doesn't know the difference between a bear chasing us and uh, uh, my part's not working or I'm having a hard time paying my bill. It reacts the same way. It increases our cortisol, our, our blood pressure goes up, it puts more glucose in our, in our uh, bloodstream. So it's preparing adrenaline and it's preparing for us to either run away from this bear or fight this bear, but there's no bear. Um, and so we have all of this, um, this cortisol and, and all of these uh, chemicals that are um, getting ready to, to run or, or fight this bear. Uh, and the last thing our body wants to do is digestion. Digestion doesn't work very well because it says uh, we need all that blood flow and such to the, um, to the core muscles so that we can fight this bear. Our immune system doesn't work very well and our sex organs don't work very well because our body's saying there's no need to even be concerned about this because this bear's going to eat me. Um, and so keeping our stress low, being able to manage our stress is a home run uh, when it comes to um, sexual performance. Uh, especially as we get older, it's almost like we have to have all of our ducks in a row anyway before everything works great. Uh, we don't need any stress in there uh, that's going to hinder that uh, process whatsoever. So through, uh, through that type of bilateral um, therapy, uh, so there was a, a lady that had panic attacks for uh, 20 years in grade school. She was nearly drowned. 18 years later, she had another near drowning, and she was brushed by an alligator. Eh, that's pretty bad. And so the second, the second event that happened, it took her back to the first event, and we throw an alligator in there. Um, so after the second event, uh, she starts having panic attacks and uh, felt like things were out of control. They put her on Lexapro to try to control that. So we did two sessions of EMDR. We reprocessed that junk and uh, uh, panic attacks are gone. No more Lexapro. Um, she's doing incredible. They measured her cortisol levels. Cortisol levels are um, back down to the normal level and um, she got her life back just by being able to process some of that junk. So the junk is stuck up here in the brain and uh, we gotta get the stuff out of the brain so that our body can work how it's supposed to work. So uh, talking about going for a, a walk, the brain is processing with the right brain, left brain movements. Um, anybody watch this movie, Imitation Game? I thought it was a really, really cool um, movie. Uh, it was about uh, World War II and how the, uh, the, uh, the Nazis, they had this, uh, this code that they would talk to all of their ships and such, and every night at midnight this code would change. And so they hired uh, um, this guy, uh, it's off of a, a true story, uh, his name was Alan Turing, and they hired him to be able to break the code. And so Alan Turing is, is credited with the first computer system and uh, he was able to build this thing and break the code. So I was looking at some uh, research they were doing about Alan Turing, and what they found out was he was a marathon runner. And so he would get up in the morning and he would run. So as he's running these, these uh, very long distances, 
You know what's going on? Right, left, right, left, right, left. He is thinking about this machine and his brain is processing. And so he would get these incredible ideas, very creative ideas, just from running. And so he ended up building the machine and breaking the code. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, are there any runners? Anybody is a runner? Uh, when you run, you notice the difference when you're done? Yeah, I, I run a lot of times for stress. I run several times a, uh, a week. And uh, if I get stressed, I'll just go home and say, baby, I'm going for a run. And I'll go run three miles. I will feel so much better because it allows the brain to process along with uh, the general exercise is good for you too. Um, so in, uh, in REM sleep, REM sleep is very important to our um, recovery also and our good mental health. So in REM sleep, if you've ever watched somebody, it's kind of freaky. Their eyes are going back and forth. Did you ever see that? It's kind of, kind of interesting. So what's happening is our brain is processing events that happened that day, uh, bigger events that our brain doesn't process, more traumatic events that get stuck here. And so we have to be able to, uh, uh, to get that out. So a disturbing event for one person may not be disturbing for um, another person. So sleep is very important for, uh, for good mental health and recovering. There are uh, five sleep stages. So uh, first is this uh, uh, stage one, which is non-REM, and then stage two, so our body is relaxing and uh, our muscles are relaxing, temperature is dropping, heart rate's dropping. Stage three and four, um, that's where we're getting a lot of uh, um, physical rebuilding, bones are rebuilding, muscles are rebuilding, tissue is rebuilding, immune, sy immune system is getting stronger. Uh, then we go into the REM sleep, and we get in REM sleep about um, every hour and a half, and that's where that good um, mental resolution is happening. If a person doesn't sleep well, they typically don't have very good mental health. They have higher stress, they have more anxiety, they have more depression. So good sleep is very important for our physical body and uh, our mental health. So we should get um, uh, REM, REM sleep. We need like about 25% would be, would be normal. Um, stage three and four is like 25%. Uh, so there's, there's an app that uh, is called Pello if you have an iPhone. That's what the, uh, the pillow looks like. And you can actually measure your sleep. So this was my worst night uh, sleep. And so sleep quality 35%, really bad. So the orange is when I was awake. Uh, purple was REM sleep, uh, green light sleep, and blue deep sleep. So I got 7% deep sleep. Hopefully I didn't lift weights today because not much recovery happened that day. This was, my, this was my best night. It was at 80% and I had 28% uh, uh, REM sleep, 24% deep sleep. So a lot of healing going on during then. So which day did I feel better? I felt a lot better uh, July 25th than I did March 7th because that sleep is very, very um, important uh, to our good mental health, and uh, uh, we want to keep our mind as sharp as possible. So you can download that app if you want. It's totally free. Uh, you turn it on, I put it in my pillowcase, and it monitors my sleep, and it tells me whether or not I have good sleep. Uh, it also tells you if you sleep with, uh, with your mate, if they get up, it records on your machine that you didn't have a good sleep. So if they're up and down all night, you have to take that into consideration because um, it could alter your, um, what your record is. So in our, um, in our sleep and uh, wakefulness, um, there are um, uh, several different types of wavelength, wavelengths. So when we're awake, we have the, uh, the beta wavelength, and so um, consciousness, reasoning, uh, and so we're at a heightened state of alertness, logic, um, so it takes a lot of energy to stay in that. And then alpha 
is deep relaxation. Uh, eyes may be closed, you're slipping into a daydream. And so that's where a lot of learning happens. So people may say, you know, you need to practice some deep breathing and some mindfulness and things like that. And years past, I'd say, why do I want to do that? That's a waste of time. But really what it does, it allows, um, uh, it allows my system to take a break. And there's a lot of learning that takes place. Um, I, was, um, I was told that uh, Einstein, he used to fall, uh, fall asleep with like a pencil in his hand. And when he, when he just started to fall asleep, the pencil would drop, he'd wake up, and then he would write down whatever he was thinking. Uh, because we're very, very creative in that uh, alpha sleep. And then a theta sleep is a much deeper, um, uh, like meditating sleep, like when we're in REM sleep, a lot of learning taking place. So spending time in the alpha and the theta is very important. We, lots of creativity, lots of mental healing that's going on. Um, and then the very deep sleep, it's rebuilding our immune system and such. That's that, uh, that's that delta. So sometimes, um, most times, it's very beneficial um, if something tragic happens to be able to, to talk through it and get the feelings out, get the thoughts out. Um, we guys aren't typically known for uh, expressing much. If anything, we have this place in our, in our uh, brain that's called the nothing place. And when we're asked, what are you thinking about? Nothing. Um, what are you feeling? Nothing. It's like we hold all of that stuff in, and being able to share that helps us to process it, even if you have to write it down. Um, it's very helpful. Um, psychotherapy is another way that can um, help people to understand themselves, their problems, situations, and such. Um, so we help lots of people that have had uh, different types of surgical events, other traumatic events, and it helps uh, a lot to be able to process that and uh, help the brain to be very healthy. And when you have a healthy brain, then you'll have a, health, you have a healthier body too. So uh, men would rather have a prostate exam than talk to a psychotherapist, um, since you've already had all of that. So um, it's safe to talk to me now. <laughs> so there's this piece about denial. So uh, many patients don't feel they have a need uh, uh, for therapy uh, for their traumatic event. Uh, patients can have a negative feeling about mental health counseling because we're not crazy. Uh, and so that seems like the generation that is my age and a little bit older, uh, it's, it's like there's a craziness that goes with mental health. And so um, you don't have to be crazy to see a mental health person. Um, we may be crazy, but you're not. Um, Many patients need um, a lifestyle change. Uh, therapy can help them to recognize that. Some people have low motivation. Uh, we can help find out why. Why don't I, why can't I do this? Um, many patients need how, need to learn how to, uh, it's called let it be. Some people will like worry about everything and so they try to control everything. So there's this song by the Beatles and it goes, let it be. I don't sing very well. Let it be, let it be, let it be. <clears throat> Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. And so when we let it be, we're not worrying about stuff that we can't fix. And the challenge is when we worry about things that we can't fix, it causes us stress. And when we have stress, it negatively affects our body. And if we're already having some challenges with our parts, it's definitely going to um, affect that. So sometimes people need new strategies dealing with uh, others, family members, coworkers. Um, sometimes people don't know that therapy can help them. Uh, they don't know where to go for therapy. And uh, all of us need um, uh, wisdom and guidance for, um, for recovery. So looking at um, some of the things that we uh, talked about. We want to have a positive outlook. If we have a positive outlook, it's going to help us to um, 
recover. It's going to help us to have a better life. It's going to help us uh, to be um, happier. Uh, it takes time for our bodies to heal from trauma. Uh, I had um, July 4th, I stayed out in the uh, sun way too long, and uh, I got something that I got for the first time. It's called heat exhaustion, and didn't realize what I had, and uh, I didn't know that when you have heat exhaustion, it takes like moisture from all parts of your body, including your bowels. And I thought I was dying. I was in so much pain, it was um, unbelievable. And so after I got my bowels moving again, it was like three days before my stomach quit hurting. You know why? Because that was like traumatic to my stomach. And that was only, that was pretty minor, but I could still feel the pain days later after the problem was gone. And so that was just the trauma of what went on. I'm sure my muscles were sore and such. So when you have an operation, there's a lot more trauma and it takes a while uh, for that to heal. And so being patient and allowing it to heal. Um, creativity with intimacy. And so use your creativity with intimacy. Uh, when we first met our wives, we probably were very romantic. We opened the door for them. We did all kind of cool things for them. And so then after you're married for a while, it's like, yeah, Open the door yourself. I'm going to get my door. It's raining. <laughs> and so being able to go back and do those, those fun things again that you did when you got married. Um, uh, I did a study years, uh, years ago on uh, 100 people that cheated uh, in their relationship. And I want to know why they cheated, what, what, what was going on. And what I found out was um, they were drawn away by flirtatious words, and it was in an office setting. So they're spending a lot of time with somebody, and they're, they're flirting with each other. And remember when we first, uh, you first met your uh, mate? There were lots of flirting words. You keep those flirting words going. That keeps the passion alive. Um, it's very good for a uh, relationship. Uh, gratitude. So being very grateful is going to increase our happiness. Uh, visualize your success. What do I want success to look like? I'm going to visualize myself doing that. I ran a half marathon, Disney math half marathon uh, last year. It's like I had to visualize myself doing that because 13.1 miles is a very long ways. And when you're running it, it's even longer than what you think. Uh, visualizing yourself doing it, it, it helps you to be able to do that. So I got one, one quick story. I have a friend of mine that was a, he was a lieutenant in New York City, and he had two guys, two officers that worked with him. And so they had a rubber gun. And so the first guy, uh, he would give the rubber gun to the supposedly bad guy, and he'd say, okay, point it at me. And so the bad guy would point it at him. He would take the gun away. He'd hand it back. He'd say, okay, let's do it again. And they practiced that over and over again so that if a gun was ever pulled on him, he would know exactly what to do. So they walk into a convenience store, guess what? A bad guy's there and pulls a gun on them. So the officer said, oh, I know, I know what to do. Didn't even think about it, because it was way back in his um, um, what, hippocampus, and so he, or cerebellum, hippocampus? Hippocampus. So he knows what to do instinctively. He goes over, he takes the gun away from the guy. You know what he did next? Gave it back to him. <laughs> True story. His partner had to shoot him. He, didn't, he shot the bad guy, not the policeman. But he had practiced it so long that he did exactly what he had practiced. He could have visualized the same thing over and over again. He'd have done the same, he'd have gave it back to the guy. So you want to visualize what you want to do and not handing the bad guy the gun back. Uh, see a psychotherapist if you need help with recovery. Uh, bilateral stimulation therapy eliminates trauma. Bilateral movements helps the brain to process walking, running, and such. Don't live in denial. And finally, seek help if you need it. So at this time, we are going to uh, turn off the uh, audio portion of this, and then we're going to go into the uh, question and answer. <laughs>